We are a people of story. We use story to help us make sense of the things that we experience every day. The power of sacred scripture is that it helps frame our stories in the light of God's larger story. For example, when Samuel is asleep in the temple, he hears a voice call his name. At this time of night, his head is foggy with sleep, and uh, he's not really sure of himself where he is, maybe, but he knows two things. First, he knows that there are two people in the building, Eli and himself. Second, he knows that he didn't call his own name, and so he can only assume that it's Eli who's calling him. Now, that's completely reasonable story, right? It's the same story I'd tell myself if I were in his position, because it fits with what I know and experience every day. Eli, jarred awake by the intrusion of young Samuel, was probably frustrated. I didn't call you, he says. Go back to bed. The story running through his mind might be that maybe Samuel is afraid of the dark and doesn't want to be alone, so he's making up excuses to come into Eli's room. Or maybe that he's had a dream and that he woke himself up and that the voice was all in his head. But the second time this happens, Eli considers a different possibility. He thinks maybe there's a different story about what's going on. Now, unlike the, bo the boy, Eli knows that he and Samuel are not alone. This is God's house, the place where God is present. He reasons that if the voice isn't coming from him and it's not coming from Samuel, then maybe it's God. It's only after Eli shares this story with Samuel that he's able to respond to that voice calling his name. Samuel's story, the paradigm he uses to make sense of what's happening, it doesn't work for him in this case. He takes the facts that he encounters, Eli sleeping in the other room, the voice calling his name, and he draws a conclusion that ends up being incorrect. The story that Eli gives him allows him to see the situation another way, to see something he hadn't seen before, that God also is present. Today, especially, you can see how the stories we use to make sense of our world can be vitally important. We are all still reeling as a nation from what we all witnessed last week at our nation's capital and in many state capitals across the country. The events of that day are the result of two widely divergent stories that we are using to make sense of our reality. We are all looking at the same picture, but our stories cause us to see different facts and to interpret those facts in very different ways, just like Samuel and Eli. What concerns me most about these two stories is not the different conclusions they draw about the outcome of the election, so much as what they say about the people on the other side. One story says that those others are either blind or complicit in some vast conspiracy, that violence is both necessary and justified against them. The other story says that others are ignorant and gullible or else malicious and traitorous. It cannot imagine that they have any value as rational persons. Regardless of which of those two stories may be closer to the truth, each of these stories dehumanizes and delegitimizes the other with devastating consequences. How many times have we heard? How many times have we said in these last days and weeks and even years I simply don't understand those people. That lack of understanding has, among us has steadily turned from confusion to mistrust to outright belligerence. But these are not the only two stories there are. There is a third story. It may not give us much clarity about what happened with the election, but I believe that it can help us move forward in a way that is beneficial to our nation and more helpful for each of us as individuals. That story is the story of Jesus. The story that we share in this community every single time we gather. A story that is largely forgotten or drowned out in our outside lives by the idols and the alliances that we use to order ourselves in the rest of life.
When St. John tells the story of Jesus calling these first disciples, he's not just reporting what happened. He's telling us a story about who Jesus is and how Jesus sees the world and the people in it. Andrew and Simon, Philip and Nathaniel, they all see Jesus and they all draw their own conclusions about who he is. Andrew thinks that John the baptizer is right, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. Nathaniel looks at Jesus and thinks he's just another hick from the sticks. But when Jesus sees each of them, he knows exactly who they are. One look at Simon is enough to tell Jesus that he's worthy of the nickname Peter or Rocky. He can tell right away that Nathaniel is a straight shooter. He knows them as he knows himself. But do you notice what's happening here? Jesus isn't just proving that he knows these people, he's telling their stories. He's retelling those stories. Nathaniel's a straight shooter, yeah, but he's also kind of a stuck-up jerk. Jesus doesn't say, now here's an Israelite who needs to be taken down a peg. He says, now here's an Israelite who speaks his mind. He doesn't focus on Nathaniel's bigotry, but on his honesty. Why is that? Well, if the gospel is to be believed, it's because Jesus looks at Nathaniel and loves him. And he loves him knowing exactly who he is. Author and humorist Christopher Moore retells the story of how Simon got his nickname Peter in his book, Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Pal, which, by the way, is well worth a read if you can have a sense of humor about your faith. <clears throat> Moore sets the scene with Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee to meet the disciples in the boat. When they see him, Jesus convinces Simon that it's not a miracle that anyone can walk on water. And so Simon steps out of the boat and he actually stands there for a moment before he sinks like a rock. So Jesus and the other disciples haul the sputtering Simon back into the boat, laughing at this practical joke the Savior has just played. And Jesus turns to Simon and says, I can't believe you fell for that, Simon. You're as dumb as a box of rocks. But what amazing faith you have. I'm going to build my church on that box of rocks. And of course, rock is what is the meaning, the translation of the name Peter. Even in the gospel accounts of Mark and Luke and Matthew, Simon Peter is impetuous and headstrong, often rushing in without thinking. Maybe Rocky is an appropriate nickname for him after all. But rather than seeing this as a flaw, Jesus honors it as a virtue. This is the story that Jesus gives us through which we just can see not only the world, but also ourselves. That we as people are more than our flaws and our failures. That even our worst traits often belie some hidden strength. Jesus sees what we cannot, and he chooses to tell that story, not the stories that we tell about one another. The story he has come to give us offers us a way of seeing that for ourselves. His entire life points to this hidden reality that even what looks like the outright rejection of God and God's good news can actually be for us the greatest blessing we have ever imagined. If only we have eyes to see it. Seeing is a powerful image in John's Gospel. Jesus is the light of the world, John says, the light which shines in the darkness so that we can see God revealed in him. What we see can help us believe, or it can keep us from believing. The Pharisees see Jesus' hometown and his lineage, and they refuse to accept him as the Messiah because he wasn't born in Bethlehem. But Thomas sees the holes in Jesus' hands and side and believes. And Jesus says to him, Do you believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And that, 
John tells us, is the entire reason why he writes this gospel account. So that we may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, we may have life in his name. The story Jesus offers us, like the story offered by Eli to Samuel, it's a story of life. It's a story that has the power to change lives, entire lives, to give us lives that is so much more abundant than the pitiful, limited stories that we tell ourselves. When Samuel opened himself to that story, he became known from Dan to Beersheba as a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. He accepted that vocation of prophet and was able to see and participate in things that God was doing for Israel. And Jesus' story offers us that same opportunity. Instead of seeing one another as either malicious conspirators or dangerous idiots, Jesus helps us reframe what we see when we look at one another. He invites us to see one another as he sees us, as beautiful and broken children of God, worthy of such love that even a life laid down is not too high a price to give us abundant, abundant life. Now we can and absolutely must reject the stories of violence and hatred that the world tries to sell us. We can and we must hold one another accountable both to our society and to our neighbors to call one another out of the broken ways that we deal with our fear and our uncertainty and our anxiety. But Jesus' story reminds us that the motivation for doing these things is never, never hatred or fear, or disgust. It is always compassion. It is always the desire that both our enemies and ourselves may have life and have it abundantly. After this week, I firmly believe that this is the single most important thing that we as Christians can do in this world. To reclaim the story of Jesus, not as a theological veneer for a political agenda or as a justification for violence, but as the story of freedom and life that it is. Whenever we see events like we did last week with people using crosses and Bibles to shroud their hatred in religion, we can tell the true story. The story of a man who loved his enemies enough to die for them. The story of a God who is powerful enough to overcome that death. Right now, we're all like aged Eli, lying in the dark of the temple, knowing full well that we have been far from perfect, far from good servants of the Lord. But we also know something that Samuel doesn't. The story that, we, that has been since the beginning, the story that we have heard, that we have seen with our eyes, that we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That story says that we are loved, and so are those people that we can't begin to understand. By sharing this story, we just might be able to experience life together that is a little bit more abundant. <laughs>